This is part two in a series of videos about astronomy versus astrology. In this video, we'll follow on from talking about the celestial sphere and talk about constellations and the ecliptic. Let's start with constellations. Uh, what we have here is, this is kind of a squished down view so that it's flat, but this is basically what you would see as a dome if you were standing in North America, somewhere in the Midwest, on the right gate. This is what you would see of the stars up above. You can see that here that I've connected the dots, I've got the names on, it would just be a star field, but you can see all of these different constellations. So we've got uh, constellations that are usually fairly familiar, like Virgo, but we've got other constellations that may be less well-known, like Corona Borealis or Corvus or other similar types of constellations. So what is a constellation? Basically, a constellation is just a region of sky. We use pictures in order to be able to tell stories, to remember things. And so what I have here is just an example of a couple of constellations. We have Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. That's basically the big bear and the little bear. Most people are familiar with this asterism, which is part of a constellation. This in the US is called the Big Dipper, although historically during slave times, it was also known as the drinking gourd. And we also uh, call this the plow in the UK. What we, what we can see here is that this allows us to also find the pole star. This is the pole star, which we talked about in, in part one of this video series. Here we can use the, this constellation to find where north is. This is also just a way of memorizing where things are. So here's the big bear, here's the little bear. And all of the constellations are basically a way, a, a mnemonic. It's a visual mnemonic allowing us to remember where things are and be able to use that for things like navigation and timekeeping. Now, I mentioned just now that the asterism known as the Big Dipper is also known by other names. Um, actually, every culture has their own name for uh, different constellations. In fact, they will pick out different groups of stars. So what you can see here, in each of these, this is a different Native American group, tribe or nation. It's got some of their constellations on here. So here we've got the Ojibwe, and here we've got, this is where the Great Bear would be, and this is where the Little Bear would be. Here we've got Dakota, or Lakota, and here we can see, again, here's the Great Bear and here's the Little Bear, but they have completely different shapes. Um, also, if we look here, this is Orion, which we'll be coming on to. Orion is a fairly recognizable constellation, and it looks quite different in the star map for the Lakota compared to the Ojibwe. And then if we move on to the Cree, here we can see again, here is Orion. Um, the, the, the big bear looks kind of like a bear, but it's the wrong way around. Um, and we have completely different animals again. It's all about telling stories and being able to uh, use that as a way to remember where things are and use it for timekeeping and as a calendar. Uh, and it goes beyond just the, the US. So here I've got Orion, fairly well known and easy to spot because of these three stars. And here you can see it again. This star on this shoulder is Betelgeuse, which is a very famous star. And so in each of these circles, we have a different group constellation where Betelgeuse is marked with a little black circle. So in Arabic, it's still the giant. It's a very similar sort of um, constellation and that uh, you know, very similar to Western. But if we go here, this is Belarusian. This is the, the throne. Chinese is the, the three bears. We've got Lakota or Dakota, uh, the buffalo embryo. Um, and if we go through Hawaiian, it's this cat's cradle. Korean, it's something else completely. We've got all these different ways of looking at it that uh, from across the planet, even though the stars basically look the same from all those locations, uh, they've been grouped together differently. So when we think about constellations, it's really just down to the culture that you're in as to what is chosen for how we group these stars together. In astronomy, we use this Western Greek-based mythology for most of our constellations but that's not the only way to see the sky. Let's stick with Orion here. And here you can see the constellations. So I've got Betelgeuse, this is Bellatrix, this is Rigel down here. And you can see how this idea of him as a hunter, in this case, he's holding a club. Sometimes he's holding a sword. Usually the sword is, or dagger is in his belt and that's these three stars down here. And so we're gonna look at Orion in a little bit more detail. 
So this is Orion as it really looks, sort of. Um, you need a really good dark sight to see it look anything like this. But again, here's Betelgeuse, which is a red supergiant, and here's Rigel, which is a blue supergiant. And uh, we'll get into the names of the other stars in a second. So when we look at Betelgeuse, so here it is again, let's start with looking at the sword or dagger. What we find is that actually one of these spots that we think of as being a star is actually a nebula. We've got names for all of these things, but the thing I want you to notice here is that they're all at different distances. So Betelgeuse is only about 400 light years away, whereas Rigel is nearly twice as far away and Saif is uh, nearly three times as far away. And then the stars in the belt are Alnitak, Alnoam, and Mintaka, and they are 800, 1300, and 900 light years away. So these stars do not have any physical association. They look like they're in the same direction, but they're actually very wide, widely spread out. And to demonstrate that, I've got it blown up here. So we're standing on Earth, we're looking out, and they look like they're all in the same, uh, all close together because they're more or less in the same direction. But actually, you can see here that they're spread out in space once you take into the account the depth, the distance that they are from us. And so there's actually no physical association between the stars in a constellation. It's just a way of looking at a portion of the sky. Now, I said we were also going to talk about the ecliptic. Uh, we needed to introduce constellations first. So here I've got, this is the Little Dipper, which is part of the Little Bear. That's the pole star. Here's the Earth, and it's spinning, and it's got its celestial equator. In the celestial sphere way of thinking about things, the sun is going around the Earth. We know this isn't true, but it's also a convenient way to think about where the sun is in the sky. And so as the sun goes around, it's going around on the ecliptic. And this is the plane of the orbit of the Earth, basically. So what we've got is that the sun will appear in the celestial sphere at different times of year, somewhere along this line called the ecliptic. The term ecliptic gives us eclipse. The moon has to be in the same plane in the ecliptic in order for us to have either a solar or lunar eclipse. When we talk about um, the ecliptic, it actually is marked out by a set of constellations that are the ones that most people have heard of, and they are the zodiac constellations. And what you can see here is, here's the sun in the middle, the earth is going around. So from the point of view of being on earth, here on August 21st, if you were looking towards the sun and you could see the stars, Again, we can't see the stars during the day because of the atmosphere. But if we didn't have an atmosphere, we'd be able to see the stars. And the stars that would be behind the sun would be these stars here, that is Leo. So actually, if your birthday is in August, you cannot see the stars that are associated with your birthday because it's uh, about where the sun is. The, as the Earth moves around, as we get to September, now as you look towards the sun, it's going to be in Virgo. As you get to October, you look towards the sun, it's going to be in Libra and so on. And so what we have is that our, the Earth is moving around the sun, but it makes the sun look like it's moving through the constellations. The Earth takes 365 and a quarter days to go around the sun. That means that from August to get back to that same position is 365 and a quarter days. And during that time, the sun is going to appear to move through all the constellations. Basically, the sun is going to appear to move by about a degree per day. And we call this path that it moves on, that's apparent motion in the sky, the ecliptic. And so the ecliptic is defined by these zodiac constellations. Remember, there are lots and lots of constellations. There are actually 88 across the entire celestial sphere, but only these 12 plus one more we'll get to later are constellations where the sun will be at some time during the year. So here we have another view of uh, this idea of how the zodiac constellations relate to the position of the earth in its orbit or the apparent position of the sun. So here's the earth and as we're looking towards the sun, if we could see the constellations behind it, again this would be August, you would see the constellation Leo and as the earth continues to orbit, in this direction, we are going to see the sun move through Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, and so on. So we're going to watch a video that shows exactly what that looks like.
So here what we've got is we're looking towards the sun. I've switched off the atmosphere. The, we're going to be pointing towards the sun. So we're basically above the atmosphere. We're looking towards the sun from the earth and we're going to watch what constellation the sun appears to be in as a year goes by. So here you can see it's in Virgo and then Libra and then Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, We keep going here we're in leo so it must be august september and we're back again now there's a few things that i want you to notice so i'm going to play it again first of all this green line that is the ecliptic that is the path of the sun the red line here that is the equator of the celestial sphere so when the sun passes through the uh, equator of the celestial sphere that's when we have equinoxes. So try to point those out again. I also want you to notice there's a couple of big blobs that are going to move around. I want you to notice them too. So here I've got, this is Venus. There's another one that's moving faster here. That's Mercury. So they are always close to the sun. So we see them all the time going, and they're basically going around and around. Here you can see the summer solstice. As we head back towards Virgo, we're going through the autumn equinox and we're back where we started. One more time. So. Winter solstice, the sun at its uh, most southerly point. Now it's the spring equinox. We've crossed, crossed the equator. Now the summer solstice, and it's going to head back into the autumn equinox. That's going to be important as we talk about seasons, which is what we're going to do in our next segment of this video series.